If you have a Bible handy, you might flip to Matthew 19, where it transitions to 20. We'll take a look at that shortly. And to give credit, uh, this sermon is brought to you by research done by Amy Jill Levine. The first words that Jesus proclaims in the Gospel according to Mark, he says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. He starts in a similar way in Matthew. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom has come near. These are the words that Jesus begins his ministry with. And the first thing he says, he talks about the kingdom. The kingdom has come near. As you flip through the Gospels, you start looking through that word, you're going to find the word kingdom all over the place. That's how he starts the parables, often, almost all the time. It's so tempting to get right into the parable without noticing how each parable starts. To what shall I compare the kingdom? The kingdom is like a family with two sons, and one runs for it and comes to his mind and comes back. But it's a parable about the kingdom. What shall I, to what shall I compare the kingdom? It's like most of these types of soil, and you sow seeds on them, and some seeds grow. But it's a parable about the kingdom. Right? It, what what shall, to what shall I compare the kingdom? The kingdom is like this mustard seed that grows. The, the start of the parables, the parables are told so that we might understand the kingdom, which is the first thing that Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come near. When, he respond, when Jesus responds to the request, teach us, Lord, how to pray, Jesus says, this is what you pray, thy kingdom come. Right? That's what we're asking for. And if you need to know what a kingdom is, it, the next words tell you. It's when thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's not a kingdom for down, just for down the road when we get there in the kingdom of God to come. It's a kingdom that begins to impact our lives now because Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near. If you want to talk about Jesus' passion, what is the thing he's always talking about? It's kingdom. The parables teach the kingdom. The teachings are about how the kingdom works. The signs, the miracles are about what is it like in the kingdom. Everyone has plenty to eat. How do we know that? Jesus feeds 5,000. It's a sign of the kingdom. And in the kingdom, all are healed and made well as the lepers and the, those who are crippled find out when Jesus comes near. In the kingdom, all are forgiven because that is what Jesus proclaims from his throne, the cross, from which he proclaims, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. <laughs> Being raised listening to sermons, I cannot tell you that I once heard a sermon about the kingdom of God. Some of you might say the same. Like, the kingdom has some... I, I don't know when it happened. Like, I, I want to go and talk to a historian of worship, or the, sort of the, the history of the church, and I want to ask this question. When did the church stop focusing on kingdom? Right? Because th this is the thing, if there is one sentence that you need to know to read Jesus well, it's pay attention to the kingdom. And when someone said, uh, the professor said that to me when I got to seminary, I went back and I read the Gospels and it changed how I read it significantly. It's the one thing that has made the most difference in how I read the Gospels. Pay attention to the kingdom. That's what Jesus is focused on. One day, if I understand why we stop preaching king, as, as the kingdom as Jesus is focused, I'll, I'll explain that to you when I figure it out myself. But today, I want to talk about the kingdom in the way that we understand the kingdom based upon this event uh, of the, the rich young man coming to Jesus and, and asking about salvation, and how it's followed by this parable, a parable of the kingdom, and, and how they're connected. I, I want us to explore that. First, we have the story of the rich young ruler, where this uh, rich fellow shows up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus says, you're Jewish. Commandments, you've heard of them? And he starts like, he starts dickering with them. Which ones? 
And to which Jesus says, well, okay, I can start giving you the list, but both Jesus and him know there are 613 commandments. If you want to start making the list, you're going to be here a while. So, like, here, here's some of the, the big ten, right? The big, t the ten commandments. Do these. And to which the young fellow goes, I've done that. Is there anything else? And it's like someone trying to ask the teacher for the questions on the test. Is there anything else on the test? To which Jesus says, okay, fine, seriously, get to the heart of the matter. Let go of your riches and follow me. And the rich young ruler goes, dude, that's my translation. And he walks away. And then the disciples look at this and go, and go whoa. To which Jesus then says, like, this is possible. All things are possible for God. And the, the disciples are going, how's this going to work? Can it work, right? Can, can this rich man get in? How does it work for a rich man in salvation? And Jesus says, you know, it, it, is, it is harder for a camel to get through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. But for God, all things are possible. Now this is usually, this is the end of chapter 19, and at this point we end the reading and we say, oh, let's preach about that. There are two problems with doing it like that. A, we let the chapter markings dictate how we read. When Matthew was writing down the gospel according to Matthew, he did not get to this point and say, hmm, I'd like to start chapter 20. Like, that, that's not in the original. Like, we have copies where the numbers aren't there. The, the idea of numbering the, the, the passages was not invented until the 4th century and was not actually, like, set in place until the 13th century. And, and so, when Matthew is sitting down and writing this down, there's no chapter marking to, that he put in there to tell, tell you, it's time to think about something else now. And also... If you look in the, the Bible, if you look at the, the, the text, like, Matthew tells you when you change locations. Like, if Jesus is saying one thing, and then he gets done teaching, Matthew then tells you, and then they got in a boat, and they went across the sea, and then they pick up the action. Right? And so if you look at the end of Matthew 19, it doesn't say, and then the disciples got up and left. And at the beginning of 20, it doesn't say, and then the disciples got up and left. No, Matthew 19 and into 20 is the same event. And if you think about it, if Jesus has just told the rich young ruler this very hard thing to hear, and then the disciples have gone, whoa, right? Jesus doesn't just like stop and leave them hanging. He tells this parable, this parable of the kingdom, so that they can understand a bit more about this, this challenging thing that has just uh, unfolded. And so we're going to read the parable is the response of Jesus to the situation where the rich young ruler is concerned about his salvation, right? This rich dude is concerned about salvation, and now we have a parable that's going to explain a little bit more about it. Okay, so we're going to read this parable. One more detail about reading. What's the title of this parable? Anyone got their Bible open? What, what's it tell you? Workers in the vineyard, right? Laborers in the vineyard, workers in the vineyard. If you, a title can help you like research something. If you want to look this up online, you look up laborers in the vineyard, you'll, you, people know what you talk about. <coughs> the challenge is, if you call it the workers in the vineyard, what's your focus? The workers in the vineyard. What did Jesus just talk about? He's just been talking about the rich young ruler, and now we have a parable about someone who owns a vineyard. If you own a vineyard, what are you? Rich, right? And he hires some people. And so what should be the title of this parable? Is it about the workers at all? Right? The workers don't really say much. This is not the parable of the, of the workers in the field. This is the parable of the rich dude who gets it. That, that's not what you'll ever find in the Bible because they don't put me in charge of those things. But that's what I call this parable. It's the parable of the rich dude who gets it. Because that's what Jesus has been talking about. A rich dude, and how does a rich dude have salvation? So this is a parable about a rich dude. The laborers, have, they're the, sort of the foil for uh, what uh, is happening. And so we read this, this and uh, 
And just to read it with a focus on the laborers, like, I, I gotta confess, this is somewhat tangential. If you, if you preach this about the workers, what it ends up being about is a, is a parable about salvation and about how God is the vineyard owner and then the people who are hired on early make a decision to follow Jesus early in life and then the people who decide to follow Jesus later in life. And isn't it wonderful that God saves everyone equally? Or you could preach it like the Jews come first and they are under... <laughs> under the law and so the, and then the, the Christians come later and they are saved by grace and some Jews complain but isn't it great how God loves everyone like you can preach that sermon and I've done it and I was wrong like I whiffed I, I, whew, right? uh, it's not about the workers it's about the, the owner so let's look at the owner Let, let's see what, what we need to know about, about the owner well first we need a few bits of uh, history for you to know to read this well. Um, first, we're talking about paying people a denarius, which is a silver coin that can buy food for about three to six days. And if all your family needed was food, that would be great, but they have families have this odd need to also have clothing. You may have noticed this in a roof. And so three to six days worth of food, that's yeah, probably about a one day's wage. It, I'm going to call it a living wage. It's what you need to live. And then another detail about uh, this passage, like what often is shocking to people who read this is that everyone is paid the same. That's not actually the shocking part. In Jewish culture, if you go back to King David in 1 Samuel 30, you'll find that King David decreed that when they went to war, the person who fought on the front line and the person who watched the baggage, they would get paid the same. All right, this idea of paying everyone involved in the same activity the same, it goes back centuries and centuries from this point. And so when they rebuilt the temple hundreds of years after King David, the 18,000 people who rebuilt the, the second temple, if, if they, after they were done with that, if they worked the full day, they got a, a day's wage, which is what they needed to live. Or if they were only able to work an hour, they still got the day's wage, which was what they needed to live. And, and so it is in Jewish culture at this point that you are paid what you need if you can work that day. And so that's not the shocking part about this parable we're about to read. Okay. So Jesus has talked to the rich young ruler, the disciples are aghast, and Jesus then responds, let me tell you a story of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like this vineyard owner and he goes out to hire some people at 7 in the morning. Gets them off to the vineyard and he says, I will pay you what is right. And then he goes back at 9. And he hires more people. And then he comes back at 11. And he hires some more. And at no point does he say to the people being hired, are you lazy? Like, there's no comment made upon their work ethic. He's just hiring the people he can get his hands on. And he comes back in midday, and he finds some more people. He says, I'll hire you, and he sends them off to work. And he comes back early afternoon, and he hires some more. And, and why do people come show up being willing to work in the afternoon? We don't know what the situation is. is, the, is in the logic of the parable, it could be they've already worked a first job. It could be they've had to take care of family members. We don't know. But there's never any judgment upon them for coming, being able to work later. And maybe he just couldn't get to them, right? And so he shows up at one, and he hires more people, and he shows up at three, and he hires more people. And this is where it starts to get weird. Because if you are working in the field, let's say, let's rewind. <laughs> How long ago were kids hired to buck bales in the summer, right? Let, let's say you're going out and you're going to get hired to buck bales. If you get hired to buck bales in the middle of the day, is it worth hiring you? Probably. Is it worth hiring someone from the point of view of the farmer to buck bales at five in the afternoon? How many bales are you going to get done? A few? Not really all that many. And so this is the shocking part of the parable. For a farmer, a vineyard owner, to be hiring people to bring in the harvest at three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon. That's not normal. And so at this point, the, the vineyard owner has either lost his ever-loving mind, it's a parable of Jesus, that's probably not it, or he has an agenda. He's trying to do something. Well, let's see what he's trying to do. 
Right, so the, the, vin the workers start showing up to get paid, and, and the last who have been there just an hour, they show up, and they are given the denarius. They are given what they need to feed their family for that day. Oh, thank you. They take their coin and they go home. And it gets to the ones who have been working all day, and they get the denarius. They are given what they need, their daily bread, so to speak, and they get miffed. Wait a minute. Don't we get more? And to which the, far, the, the vineyard owner says, friend, I'm not doing you any wrong. Like he doesn't respond by saying, you, you ungracious fellow, go away. I'm never going to hire you again. He says, friend, I'll hire you tomorrow. Like your neighbor, I'll, I'll hire you. Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree to work for me for a day's wage? And am I not giving it to you? I'm giving you what you need. I choose to give the people who worked last the same as I give you. Am I not allowed to do that? Or are you envious because I am generous? All right. He's going to hire all these people to get tomorrow. And he's going to give everyone who works what they need. And that's what he does. He takes care of them. And I hear in this, the generosity of this fellow, I hear echoes of scripture where it says that God sends the rain both upon the righteous and the evil, right? This guy is being as generous as God, in the same way that God is generous, sending what is needed upon people, giving them what they need. The vineyard owner, knowing how much he has, is being generous in the way that God is so that the community is built towards the kingdom of God where all people have what they need. This explains why the vineyard owner goes back again and again and again to hire more people. It's not about him maximizing profits. It's about, he already has a vineyard. He's got plenty, right? He's going to be okay. It's not about him maximizing profits. It's about finding as many people as possible such that he can offer them what they need. What, what do people need? They need the dignity of work worth doing, and they need the security of a living wage. Right? That's what he's offering people. He's trying to find as many people as he can to be able to give them what they need. The dignity of work worth doing and the security of a living wage. Now you might ponder, like, what, if you play this parable out, does this mean that the next day, the people who showed up at 7 are going to, like, dodge the guy in the early morning and try to, like, show up late in the day to get hired late? <coughs> and the logic of this parable... I don't think so. I, I think the idea would be that if you catch on, if you become part of this, you want to go to work earlier because it's work worth doing, so that there are spots for those who need to be able to work later in the day so that all might have what they need. This parable does not stand by itself. It answers the question of the disciples, how can a rich person be saved? The person who has abundance, salvation means catching Jesus' passion for the kingdom, the same as anyone else, and having received and continuing to receive the gift of salvation, of being transformed personally, to go out and in thanksgiving for this gift, to give in the similarly generous fashion, so that the kingdom is built. And all have what they need, the dignity of work worth doing and the security of a living wage. The burden and the challenge of abundance is to find ways to use it so that living wage and work worth doing becomes normal, expected, common. And while people who follow, just, who follow Jesus can disagree about how this might happen, like, I'll leave that argument to the economists and the politicians. Have fun, right? That's not my gig. Here is my gig. It is the will of Jesus Christ that all might have work worth doing and a living wage to support themselves. How we get there? I don't know. But that's what the kingdom looks like. And those who have wealth, like the vineyard owner, are in a position to do more about this, and so they are called to do so. How is a rich person to be saved? It is no different than anyone else. Accept the gift of forgiveness, and then respond to grow the kingdom which has come near. And if you have more to be generous with, then do so. Amen.